for their scope. Black cap gnat catchers will become abundant. So you'll see them in the winter without their black caps and in the summer with the black cap. You won't be uh, trying to see the one or two that regularly occur in Arizona, thank goodness. Um, but you'll be able to study them at, at leisure. There's a rain, uh, there's a train called Chepe, Chihuahua Pacific Railway. It's a lovely train. It starts in Los Mochis near Tobolombampo on the Gulf of California and will bring you to a Puerto Rico where we just saw the boat ride and then up to um, Barranca del Cobre or Copper Canyon National Park right through it. You can stop at Creel, you can see it there. Divisidero on the way, there's a wonderful hotel, the Mirador Hotel, which has, by the way, dozens of hummingbird feeders and you'll just be bumping noses with white-eared hummingbirds and, and barreling hummingbirds every five seconds, in addition to um, uh, by the crown hummingbirds and a number of other montane hummingbirds, including possibly sometimes the bumblebee hummingbird that uh, Chris was mentioning. Your hotel will have this view of the Sierra Cahuy drainage of Copper Canyon. That's where you'll eat dinner and lunch. And that over to the right out that window, you can see a, a, uh, the banister of one of the balconies that overlooks this. And you can watch zone tail hawks while you're while you're having dinner or hear ear kit sounds. Here at a place called Cusarari Canyon, which is a nature preserve, the ear kit sow becomes a common bird. You have a good chance of seeing one there. It's protected. You'll also see recreators and hikers. Very safe region and very enjoyable. And you'll be able to buy, you know, food from the vendors there and and pine baskets that will smell wonderful for years in your house. If you're lucky, you'll, you'll encounter flocks of thick-billed parrots, one of the most endangered endemic parrots of Mexico. It used to be found in Arizona by the thousands. In the 1800s, they were, they were, they were all eaten by miners. They were shot and eaten by miners. They were salted. Here's a, an example you won't see Usually in Arizona, the white-eared hummingbird looking like this, but in the heart of its range, you'll see them in the top plumage, and you'll also see them in juxtaposition with other specialties, including the thick-billed parrots at their natural nest sites in certain areas, including this one, Madeira. It has a wonderful hotel. They call it the Apple Inn. <laughs> Nothing to do with Macintosh computer, but it's very nice. Um, the Los Lobos Cafe, which is not a cafe, it's a, a lovely old-time restaurant with, uh, with, a, with some character, and they'll often give you a gift in, in addition to the wonderful food that you'll eat. And you'll see on the way in uh, the little coat of arms of Madeira, including the cortero, which they call it, or the thick, uh, thick old parrot, which has that bold wing pattern underneath. And if you know where to go, you even have signs directing you to a nesting area. <laughs> One of the most spectacular parrots you'll ever see. We can see them today in the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. It's nice to see them in the wild. They're declining because of the habitat destruction, but uh, they um, are uh, still in numbers in certain areas, and I've seen flocks of as many as 300 at a time in that region. Well, we can continue from that re that part of, uh, of Mexico down to Mazatlan to the Tufted J Reserve, or what's called in Spanish the Reserva Charapinta, the Painted J Reserve. They call it the Painted J. When you get to Mazatlan, you will then drive another couple of hours or less than because they built uh, 10 years ago a high speed toll road that took the traffic off the, the road that took an arduous three or four hours of, of being stuck behind uh, trucks. Now that road's an excellent birding road because there's almost no traffic on it. And you can see more tufted jays along that road than you can in the reserve, but you can see plenty in the reserve as well. And you'll see these uh, wonderful uh, sign, welcome to um, Reserve of Charapinta. Here's an, uh, a Google uh, map that shows kind of the grassy clearing with some cabins. And you'll meet uh, the, the, uh, the local uh, population from El Palmito, very friendly. It's an ejido. This is a Mexican uh, government. Uh, it's sort of 
the akin to a sort of like combination between an Indian reservation and a and a county, and they have sort of their own. Um, uh, uh, they can they can basically uh, they have full authority to defend their area to stop illegal logging and such. But this this particular Hito decided to start ecotourism with the Tuck to Jay Reserve. They have great food service, they have comfortable cabins, and that are quite friendly. Here's, here's what some of the cabins that you can enjoy in that clearing. And then if you're lucky, you can see the, the Tuck to Jay, a spectacular um, Corvid. Uh, pretty big, and it's one. It looks a lot like the whitetail day, the Jay of Peru, which is uh, 4,000 miles to the south. Only they don't have the crest. With, uh, of course, the, you can tell you're in the tropics with the bromeliads and other um, vegetative components. So pretty exciting to see Tufted Jay. There's its range. That's its only range. I even heard a conspiracy theory that the, that they were actually white. Tail jays were imported by the Incas all the way up to Mexico from from South America, and then they they started this uh, this colony of chuffed jays, which is absolutely not true. <laughs> and there's another warbler down here, the red warbler. It, how many people saw a red warbler up at, at Car Canyon, uh, up in up in the uh, up in the Catalina Mountains? Uh, not Car Canyon, sorry, Rose Canyon Lake. No one saw. It? Anyway, they were seen a few years ago, but it wasn't this race. This is the gray-cheeked form, which is the northern form. It's non-migratory. And if you look at these two, it was the white-cheeked form, and I'll get to that in a moment, but this is the gray-cheeked form. This is gonna be your next split. And then the white-cheeked form is in the transvolcanic belt in the Sierra Madre del Sur down here. Um, they don't migrate, neither one does. So uh, how that bird ended up in Arizona is a mystery, but it wasn't, it wasn't accepted yeah, onto the Arizona Rare Birds Community, Committee's list of uh, officially accepted birds of Arizona. This is the gray-cheeked form, which is only a limited range of uh, possible endemic that's gonna undoubtedly be split in the future. You can see those two disjunct ranges. It was a white-cheeked form, this one which is even further south and doesn't migrate. So it's probably a result of an illegal uh, transport by bird trappers from Mexico. And it might've got away and ended up going to where they do best, which is in the highlands. You can see this is an ABA, uh, an ABA podcast way back when, uh, in, in April 9th, 2018, uh, that was when the first ones were, the first individual was seen and there were no, only one individual, but it wasn't accepted. You can see the bumblebee hummingbird. This is a male. Okay, now Chris was mentioning in his lecture that uh, the bumblebee hummingbird um, was recorded in Ramsey Canyon, and it was, but that Ramsey Canyon was not in Arizona, it seems. Okay, it might have been in Arizona, so we may, may have never had. That's, that may help explain why there's never been a record since, and those were females collected. Um, Mount Trogon, this could be one of our next birds to watch for in Arizona. See, its range gets really close to Chiricahua, so be watching for that. They're kind of a, an elegant Trogon on steroids with those beautiful big white patches under the, under the tail. So the difference between that and the elegant? The elegant has kind of a lattice uh, uh, tail okay. <laughs> plumage, yeah. Uh, but they have a totally different voice. This one uh, sounds like an a responding to kids out. It's a kind of a, a, a murmuring owl-like call, unlike the, the rat, raspy call of the elegant trogon. Bubbly hummingbird, you can see it, it's really far south of the border. Um, they do, they are nomadic, however, so there's a potential that could have uh, been a legitimate sighting, but that the specimens have been lost and there's no, there's no evidence. I took this picture a few uh, weeks ago, about two months ago, less than that, of a barrel hummingbird. This is not augmented or anything like that. But when you get down to the, to the, the main ranges of these birds, you'll see them in, the, in their top plumage. But if you can view a barrel hummingbird, and if you look at most of the photographs of barrel hummingbird that you see taken in Arizona, they're shooting up at the bird, which is not the angle that the feathers iridesce. So if you're above the bird, 
you'll see these beautiful purple on the tertials and, and bronzy color on the wings and, and uh, different. Uh, they can flare iridescent green on their hood as well. If you look at the new the seventh edition, I believe it is, of the uh, National Geographic uh, North American Field Guide, you'll see those colors depicted. Go ahead and do that after this talk. Beautiful views can be had from Sierra, uh, Reserva Char Pinta if you spend the night. And you can see uh, stitching owls as well there. It's a beautiful area. This is a big barranca or canyon that holds crested wands and great swallowtailed swifts and other endemics of the Sierra Madre Occidental like the green striped brushfish. And Aztec thrush, if you ever want to see an Aztec thrush, is your best chance. How many people have seen an Aztec thrush? A couple of you, a few of you have in Arizona, right? Right. Um, you have a better chance of seeing them in, in, in numbers over there, but uh, I think this bird is declining. We're, we're not finding them in the numbers we're, we used to find them um, throughout Mexico. Maybe it requires habitat that's intact and a lot of habitats being fragmented for logging. Speaking of logging, the world's biggest woodpecker was found up in these mountains from 6,000 to 10,000 feet. The 23 inch imperial woodpecker, imperial ivory billed woodpecker. So basically a, a red tailed hawk sized woodpecker that makes an ivory bill look like a chickadee. And uh, I looked for them for 25 years in the Sierra Madre. I met people who ate them and I believe did. And they told me the story, but they told me it was a beautiful bird and they put out their, put out their hands like that to, to talk about the wingspan. They didn't know what happened to them. Um, but uh, logging and poisoning, they occurred like acorn woodpeckers in groups. So imagine a dozen or two dozen of these things hanging out and flicking bark off of trees. I, I, I scoured the Sierra Madre and went to all the worst places, which are all the best places. But unfortunately, I think I was about 20 years too late. I started in the late 80s and ended uh, toward the early 2000s. I think, unfortunately, this bird's extinct. So we can then travel down from, from Mazatlan and the Tufts of Jay Reserve all the way down to San Blas, and on the way, we can look for bass ducks. I discovered a, uh, the world, I mean, not the world's, but Mexico's main bastion of mass ducks in a place that was overlooked by birders about two hours south of Mazatlan, two hours north of San Blas. This is a female, but uh, there are males, uh, there was a, and I looked at the whole overall picture in Mexico, and it, it showed that uh, mass ducks were barely seen. And I'd seen them in a number of states in Mexico, but many years go by between sightings, but I, f I found a good population in that area. So now we bring people to see mass ducks. And you see, as you travel south, you get into the Sinaloan thorn forest, which is that same forest of dry tropical forest, deciduous forest that goes all the way to the Guanacaste Basin of Costa Rica. And it's the richest habitat in the Americas for birds, not the rainforest isn't. It's the dry tropical forest. It's also one of the most threatened because it's easily burned. But if you get into these dry forests, you have a heck of a time enjoying your birding. And I bring different birders, and there's a lot of young birders now that that like to uh, to go out, and and uh, they um, they contact us through the website, and we take them out for a joyful day of birding around Puerto Vallarta area, where you can see up to 40 endemic species in one day. But going south from Mazatlan, you can get to San Blas in four hours, less than. And uh, around four or five hours. And then uh, this beautiful um, estuary uh, of mangrove preserve um, of the Rio San Cristobal and La Tovera, where you can hire a boatman, and there's some known boatmen in that area that really know where the birds are to see some specialties. The most famous of which is Chancho. Chancho. Can, anyone know Chancho? Yeah. Yeah, some of you might. And uh, also, you, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna go out early, so you're not gonna have time for breakfast. You're gonna bring your breakfast with you. It's famous for it's been banana bread over there. So they have banana bread all over the place, and you can you can buy piping hot banana bread and uh, bring it out with you. In fact, he's got a piece of it in his hand. <laughs> Wonderful man. This is a this man has worked hard to to preserve these mangroves and to leave a legacy. He's still active. He's in his seventies. Um, still active boat boat uh, piloting, but look, he doesn't wear glasses. 
<laughs> and he doesn't use binoculars. They can spot the boat filled herons, all these things. Let's take a look at it. You, you look at these, uh, here you can see a stylized Google map of the different estuaries, all of which are shrouded in mangroves. And then San Blas, which was a Spanish port, it was the biggest port on Mex in Mexico um, before, um, in the 1700s. Here we have um, the rufous neck wood rail. That's one of the most wanted birds, and you can see them readily via um, Chancho's assistance. And sometimes at Matinchin Beach, you can even walk on the beach and walk on the backside of the mangroves, and they'll come sneaking out as well. And so this is a bird that a lot of people really like to see. Um, this is Chris and, and Mary. Um, enjoying mangrove birding. It's not at San Blas. It was in, in a similar habitat in, in, uh, in Puerto Vallarta, but I put it in there as a perfect example of a, of a place. There's, an, there's a crocodile conservation area. They call it the, the Cocotrilario, which translates to crocodile farm, but what it really means is that they're protecting the crocodiles, American crocodiles, big crocodiles in that area. And you can see rufous like wood rail like we did. You can also see Ridgeway's Rail up in the San Blas area, um, which it used to be called Clapper Rail. On the Pacific Coast, they split them off. And then on the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast, we still have the Clapper Rail. And down in Costa Rica, we have the Mangrove Rail. So they split Clapper Rail into three species. The unusual beak of the Boatville Heron. And uh, they still don't know what that beak is exactly for. But I do know that they're nocturnal feeders, and, and there's a lot of crustaceans, and in particular, a type of, of a shrimp. And that might be a good adaptation to gobble them down. We have a good cooler pouch as well. Well, they have a, an extendable cooler pouch, not as much as a pelican, but they definitely do. And I think that's probably an adaptation for that. Here they are nesting with, that, with their New Guinea headdress um, alternate plumage at this time of year, which isn't often seen during the time most birders go there, which is during the winter, but it's good birding all year in, in, in Mexico. And uh, if you can take the heat in the lowlands, you'll, you'll get um, tempered just like we do here in Arizona by the monsoons. And a lot of birds wait until the rains to breed. Boat build, I mean, uh, bare-throated tiger heron as well breeding in the mangroves, common down there. In fact, you can see them on the way to Alamos. There's a little reservoir there, and if you go there, you'll see bear and tiger here, five hours drive from here. They often sun their wings like a, like a, um, like a turkey vulture does. They're named after the immature plumage. So you see they're more tigerized as young birds. Pretty common in that area. There's a wonderful wood store colony, one of the biggest wood store colonies in the Americas, north of South America. And uh, it's an endangered bird in the United States. It's a little bit threatened in Mexico, but there's a, a good population. The main one on the Pacific coast of Mexico is right up uh, about uh, 15 kilometers up the Rio San Cristobal to Zoquitlan Lagoon, Laguna Zoquitlan. And I'll show you that. And there you can see numbers of wood storks. This is just a small portion of a big colony that can be seen from space. <laughs> if you look, this little circle oh my is that colony. And all this is birds feeding. Let's go a little closer. And you can, you can also see northern potu. So, it used to be called common potu and was found on the west coast and the, and the Gulf Coast of Mexico throughout Central America and down into South America. But then they realized that the west coast birds had a different voice. Kind of not, not at all like the common potu, which is kind of a ooh, ooh, ooh. And th this is more like ah! <laughs> Excuse me, I have a little cough. <laughs> You can see the young bird in its pajamas there. They don't make a nest. They just uh, lay the egg and balance it on a little crotch in the tree, and the adult bird guards it. At night, you can go out with spotlights by boat via Chencho and see them in, uh, to advantage and see their bright yellow irises. Spectacular, big, you know, this 
this is a big, a big. Uh, uh, it's re it's not related to the Campomelianids. This is a, it's it's its own group, a neotropical group, the Potus, and the northernmost, the northern Potu can be found in the mangroves of San Blas, and easily seen while you stay at the Garza Canela Hotel, which is the boat build Heron Hotel. It's a lovely hotel, nice rooms, great restaurant. A little slow on service. You might have to go to one of the faster ones, like Walla Walla restaurant. That you want to make your boat ride, but uh, and there's some. Uh, and instead of they have the Gila woodpecker reaches its southernmost distribution down there. <laughs> and, and don't worry, this is not burlesque. It's going to be birds. Okay, so anyway, you got the the West Coast endemic relative to Gila woodpecker reaches its southernmost distribution in San Blas is the uh, golden-cheeked woodpecker. Beautiful species. A lot of trans-hemispheric migrants come down through San Blas, so it's a major uh, estuary and reserve, and you'll see hundreds of species on your, on your trip, undoubtedly. Um, interesting enough, in interestingly enough, I've been waiting since my first trip down there in 1986 for to be able to visit the Islas Tres Marias. And you can see these islands here. There's more than three of them, but the three Marias, the three biggest ones, and uh, especially uh, where Puerto Vallejo is in uh, Isla Maria Madre, you can now visit. It was a penal colony for over 100 years. And, with, um, and it's kind of a preserve of the way the west coast of Mexico was 100 years ago when more. So they broke, the, this, this mural shows the breaking the chains of bondage of the prisoners which were removed from the islands in, in 2019. And now it's a national park that can be visited by a special boat. You can see some of these spectacular birds and one of the most endangered birds in the world and in Mexico is a yellow-headed parrot. It's abundant on the islands. It used to be abundant on the mainland. It, it, they all, almost all of them captured for the pet bird trade. You go out in a special boat. It's a high-speed boat with good good service on this third-world country, Mexico. I don't want to go, but anyway, you've got a beautiful boat that they that they set up in 2019, and we're going to open in 2020. And what happened? <laughs> COVID. <laughs> so they didn't start going until 2022, and uh, but now they're regularly visiting the islands. They they took all of the 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 barracks for the prisoners and made them into very nice accommodations with air conditioning, hot water, your own kitchenette, and you can have you can have one for the size of a family or you can have your own individual one depending on what you want or if you want to have a budget, uh, if you have a budget you want everyone wants to stay in just one, you'll have a bunch of uh, bunk beds in some of them, but you can have whatever budget you want and they're all inexpensive because the government of Mexico, and we have to say that uh, President Lopez Obrador um, has, uh, he played a role in this. He's not that popular in Mexico, but I am very pleased with the opening of the Islas Marias, the Islas Tres Marias. And right now we can just visit Isla Maria Madre, but they're gonna, they have uh, plans to open all the islands with the appropriate protections. This is a national park now, and you can see some spectacular birds. Um, and it's only four hours less than four hours from San Blas, so you can stay at San Blas, store whatever you don't want to bring out to the islands, go out for three days. They limit the, the, the trips to three days on this fast, comfortable boat with food service on the way, have and stay at your wonderful location. The, the whole price, all inclusive, the most expensive, what I do is about $300 for three days. and you'll visit this fantastic place and see yellow-headed parrots in the wild. Right, they, they hang out by the, by the uh, barracks, by your, your tourist accommodations. You'll also see one of the most limited range hummingbirds in the world, the, East, the Tres Marias hummingbird. This is a female, but it's, they basically look a lot like broad-billed hummingbird, okay? Only they're the size of a blue-throated hummingbird, so island gigantism. You'll see an unusual race of streaked back dorial. These are islands, so, so they, the birds have diverged. They've, they've um, uh, embarked on a path of adaptive radiation and changed their form. This is a giant 
just like the hummingbird, another island giant, but with hardly even any streaks on the back and much more yellow, not so orange like the mainland form. And they act like a nuku pu'u in the Hawaiian Islands, um, which is now unfortunately possibly extinct, um, by, by scaling bark and, and, and extricating insects from inside the little twigs of the thorn forest on the island. Here's an example of, um, I think the color is a little bit off on this projector, but anyway, that's a street vector of the mainland type that some of you probably have seen, um, even in Arizona. So then you want to head toward Puerto Vallarta, uh, and, uh, and uh, you'll, you might stop on the way through Tapic, which is the capital of Nayarit State, and there you'll find Parque Ecologico, or Ecological Park. It's a lovely place with a little jogging path and lovers sitting by the, by the water um, and sipping on a little mimosa or something like that. And then you'll find also the endemic Aztec rail. And you'll probably even be able to photograph it. You'll have your camera gear out. This is, a, this is an educated college, college town. You don't have to worry that you're gonna be mugged or anything like that. It's very family oriented. And you might also see, this is one of the best places in the world to see one of these. Yeah. A spotted rail. The ghost of the, of, the, of the marshlands. However, here they make regular appearances in the open. And then on your way to, to uh, you know, to uh, Puerto Vallarta, you'll probably stop at the Mexican 7-Eleven, which is the OXO. Anyone ever heard of OXO? There's 42,000 outlets, <laughs> and it's sort of, and it's a fast food. <laughs> They're all over Mexico, but they go all the way to Colombia. I've had them in Colombia, El Salvador, Panama, but uh, most of them are in Mexico. They're just sort of like 7-Elevens, and you can go there and get some. My, I know that my my clients always uh, start salivating like Pavlov's dogs whenever they see an OXO because I always buy them uh, at, at Magnum Bar. <laughs> also, by the way. It's good to have oxos around. Um, it's true that uh, the obesity rate in, in Mexico has, has risen because of, uh, possibly because of the, the easily obtained fast food and processed food. However, one thing, it's always a challenge in the neotropics to get food early in the morning in time to, to eat breakfast, right? I mean, to, in time to go birding early enough. You, you don't want to spend two hours eating breakfast during the best birding hours, 24 hours. You can get coffee, you can get whatever you need. And we'll go to a late uh, brunch or lunch after the hot birdie. I don't see too many complaints on those faces. You, you can drive all the way then a couple more hours, you'll get to Puerto Vallarta. And if you look at this picture, it's pretty telling. Most of these, these uh, Mexican towns now have these, these monuments that say the name of the town, but they always have to do with the history of the town. So if you look over here, Puerto Vallarta has a big conservatory for American crocodiles. Look at these two things. Those are Rufus Neck wood rails. This is Little Blue Heron. They have reefs offshore. They have marlin fishing. They have uh, Pacific bottlenose dolphins. They have mahi mahi. They have spotted eagle rays. They have, uh, they have uh, a wonderful whale watching in the winter time for humpback whales and so on and so forth. Oh, well, the military macaw, military macaws, they have a big sanctuary for military macaws, so it's a nice welcome when you ever come to, uh, by road into Puerto Vallarta, you see this big sign, and it tells you a lot about the place. You can have fun, this is one of my friends, um, Fernando Romo um, on the coast, looking at uh, shorebirds. He was at that time. We had you know a big movement of lease terns coming through, but also uh, a lot of shorebirds. And offshore, you can see boobies, brown and blue for the boobies, easily from shore there. And you see Puerto Vallarta in the background. But look at this. Look at that habitat. That's Puerto Vallarta back there. Some years ago, I went on a private uh, flight. There was a um, philanthropist, a pilot, and she she took me. And we did a flyover to, to look at the quality of the habitat of Cabo Corrientes and the surrounding mountain ranges of the Sierra Madre um, around Puerto Vallarta. And the, the Los Arcos Archipelago, these three islands in the foreground center, and in the background is, is Puerto Vallarta. There's a gap between the development, that's actually the airport. <laughs> and, it's, and it's right on the, 
um, the border between Nayarit and uh, to the north and Jalisco states. So that divides them. But because they're in a different time zone, they had to do something about that because people kept missing their flights. So they adapted the, the, fl the, the time zone that main, the main town of Puerto Vallarta is in, which is central time, to the whole region, and that way you don't miss your flights. <laughs> but there's a major jaguar population here. We have, trail we have uh, camera traps. It's great for, here's the plane cap star throw, you see some of the color on the plate, plane cap star throw. Again, it's during, you know, in the heart of their range, where you can see the color a little better. Rosy thrush tanager, whole new species, a uh, whole new family of birds. It's common in, in certain parts of that. Um, you can see the disjunct range of it. So if you go Puerto Vallarta, you might want to go to Rancho Primavera to see the, the beautiful rosy thrush tanager. If you go to Panama, you might want to go to Parque Metropolitano. You can see that little section. And if you go to the, um, uh, the if, you, if it ever opens again, if you go to uh, Venezuela, you might go to the Maracaibo Basin and see them. They have motmots, perhaps a crown motmot. And Mexican wood nymph. Oh, happened to the Mexican wood nymph. Okay, oh yeah, I put it in another spot. Okay, but Mexican hermit. And you also have a military McCall Reserve, a Rancho Sanctuary. This is grassroots conservation, and in the last 10 years, they've doubled the population from 1,000 to 2,000 pairs of, of military macaws because of the efforts of one family and the nest box program. And they built this, uh, this uh, observation tower that you can enjoy. You can even lay on a couch up there and identify your birds. <laughs> and see military cause at that angle, at their angle. See the range of military macaw. If you notice that there's two main populations of military macaw, there's a big section of Central America that hasn't, doesn't have military macaws. It has great green macaws, like in Costa Rica, but not military macaws. So maybe there's two different species involved because there's, there's about a thousand mile gap. This photograph that I took is on the cover of my guide, and you can have one if you want after this. I uh, give it away um, just to inspire you. Um, but I took this photograph in, in the winter of 2009-10, and then the family that owns that preserve, now a preserve, went to see their, you know, to their families like Mexicans do. And in, in fact, in, in the holidays, you'll see the evidence of the middle class because you'll see people driving around their SUVs with, it's like the who's from Whoville, with, with piles of presents on top of their cars driving all over Mexico. Um, but anyway, they came back and that tree was chopped down. And the baby macaws were, were stolen. And that spurred, and it had that opposite effect that the, that the uh, poachers thought would happen. It spurred a grassroots movement to conserve macaws. They even had, I wish I had one of the pictures, but it shows a picture of a human in, in, a, in, in a jail. If you put a baby macaw in jail, you're gonna be in jail, okay? And, uh, and uh, they started that, and then Jorge Novoa, uh, the, one of the uh, brothers of the, of the trio, uh, trio of brothers, and then um, um, Francisco Espinosa, he, they protected this area and then they started experimenting on nest boxes and once they found the right size ne nest box design, which is like a wine barrel, yeah. they put them up in the trees and uh, they doubled the population in 10 years. So um, I know we're, we're getting nearer to the end of this, but I just want to go quickly. Cabo Corrientes is a, a Cape of Currents, is this, this left hand of uh, 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 peninsula of land or Cape, and uh, it's covered in because it faces north, it, it has a tropical broadleaf forest. And there's three species of hawk eagles there uh, that we discovered. Look at that beautiful forest that's above Yalapa. <laughs> and you can see this very limited range hummingbird endemic to West Mexico, the Mexican wood nymph. You can see endemic uh, Mary, no, <laughs> endemic uh, crusty crown ground sparrow. And from a, a place that used to be a hang glider port, 
called Yalapa Tapa, above Yalapa. Um, there used to be astro AstroTurf when I first went there 20 years ago. There was AstroTurf, and you could actually, you know, the hang gliders would run on the AstroTurf and, and go out to outer space. But now we watch for raptors. And here's an example of the black and white hawk eagle, inverted in flight, taken recently from that location. Right it, it, there's a few pairs, and they're commonly, it's not a common. It's not a common hawk eagle, but it's readily seen in that area. So, what do they look? Yeah, oh, the, that was they. That was a nuptial display, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time and paying attention while I was shooting with my sixteen hundred millimeters. Wow. There's the range of black and white hawk eagle, but before our adventures in that area, they. This is Cabo Corrientes. And they were thought to be Eastern Mexico through Amazonian um, South America, but we discovered a new population in the West Coast of Mexico. <coughs> and there's a closer view of where they're found now in, that, in the area around Puerto Vallarta. Beautiful. You can also see orcas and other animals. There's a mystery bird, this uh, Sinaloa martin. It looks like a snowy-bellied martin or a Cuban martin, but it's endemic to as a breeder to Western Mexico, but nobody knows where they winter. See, it's dimorphic. They've been seen in kind of migration in Central America, but not during winter. Nobody knows. You can see the real, the living ivory bill. So you've got a big ivory bill woodpecker that still exists, the pale bill woodpecker, genus Capetalis. And in the north, you have lineated woodpecker, which is, uh, uh, that race has a white bill, black banded orioles, San Blas Jay, which would really be called the Port of Vallarta Jay, because it's common in Port of Vallarta and rare in San Blas. <laughs> the beautiful orange breasted bunting, which is endemic to West Mexico. The red breasted chat, also endemic. What a dazzler. That's where it's found. There is some danger in Mexico, though. <laughs> You might get a few, uh, that guy, he, get, he got, this was, he was just nothing but jovial, even with his uh, mosquito and, and the black fly bites. But if you use insect repellent, you won't, you won't get them. So just use them ahead of time. <laughs> or a long shirt. Can anybody identify this owl? Don't be afraid, just, just take a guess. Vermiculated is a very good uh, guess, but believe it or not, this is something you didn't know about. This is a whiskered screech owl. They have a rufous morph in Mexico. So in the mountains above Puerto Vallarta, you can see whiskered screech owl, rufous morph. Beautiful. And here's a rufous morph of ear corwell. This is a bird that was disappeared from science for 50 years um, and was rediscovered uh, around 40 years ago. And uh, now we find them commonly in, in uh, Cabo Corrientes that I showed you. And last but not least, we're almost done with this, is Colima, or Volcan Nevado de Colima, a beautiful national park in, a, in, in, a, in, a, a, in an active uh, volcanic zone that's covered in forest and is fantastic for birding. Here we'll see it. Now you can see with the uh, Google map, the satellite map, and you can, there's roads that go up there and there's, there's lodging in that area. <coughs> you can see the Mexican violet ear. This one's in display. Okay, so we've seen Mexican violet ear. Um, it used to be called green violet ear, but they split the lesser violet ear uh, from, south, uh, from Costa Rica south into South America, off from that, which doesn't have any blue on the chest. You can't really see the blue too much on this one, but you can see the, the articulated auricular coverts, um, violet auricular coverts of this beautiful nomadic species. There's around 360 plus or minus hummingbirds in the world, and there are 58 kinds in Mexico. The beautiful chestnut-sided trike vireo up in the cloud forest up there. And the last but not least, this uh, balsas screech owl which is found, I took this one near the home of Carlos Santana in uh, Navarro de, <laughs> the Atlan de Navarro. And, you, and now when you go to that town to go birding, you'll see a big 
guitar <laughs> on either side of the town uh, for, uh, for Carlos Santana. So um, I'm gonna close with something that's remarkable. So Mexico really wants Americans to come back. Yes, partly economically, but they're into um, now utilizing their biosphere reserves and national parks. And this one, the city of Ciudad Victoria, the mayor's office called me and said, we want you to come over and we'll pay for you to come over. And we're gonna give you a, a grand tour of our area. His associate knew that I'd been there before, but they wanted to show me what has changed in that area. And it's remarkable. So you have this El Cielo Biosphere Reserve. When I was a kid, there was a Time Life, Time Life Library book called El Cielo. And it was all about this beautiful area. It's a beautiful, it's the northernmost cloud forest in, in, in the Americas. It's only four hours drive south of Texas. You can see Kill Bill Toucans there. <laughs> You're gonna have breakfast in McAllen, the sister city of Ciudad Victoria, and end up uh, seeing the Kill Bill Toucan by the end of that day. Here they are with some of my guides, <laughs> uh, mesmerizing, the press was out, the mayor excited, the mayor's assistant, the, the minister of tourism. Look at that beautiful unspoiled habitat. They built a big observatory, an aerial observatory. You can see this road in the background. There's no cars on it. What they did is they built a toll road to take the traffic off of this road and now that whole area, is, it has archeological ruins and, and it's known for birding, great birding. Um, it's for families to enjoy a habitat where you can see one of the most limited range owls of the world, the Tamalithus pygmyal. It's found in the Northern Sierra Madre Oriental, not Occidental. And you can identify, you can get there from South 